Hi, I'm Bob Iaculo. United Water believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. From service to civilian, veterans in the workforce next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the heart of academic medicine, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities, Wells Fargo, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Choose New Jersey, our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State and by N.J. Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan. Turn a dream into a degree. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, over the next few years, we will see thousands of soldiers returning home. One of the biggest challenges a veteran is going to face is finding a job and adjusting to civilian life. Here in the studio to discuss the ways that we can help our veterans return successfully uh, home, we have Ryan Davenport, veteran and member of the New Jersey Army National Guard. Back with us again is Dr. Rich Robitaille, Assistant Vice President of the Office of Military and Veterans Affairs at Berkeley College. Jeff Clare, CEO of an organization called Be a Hero, Hire a Hero. And finally, Kim Mitchell is president and co-founder of the Easter Seals Dixon Center for Military and Veterans Services. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. And throughout this program, you're going to see a variety of websites that are very useful, very valuable in terms of uh, folks that are out there trying to help veterans uh, deal with the variety of issues they face. Let me ask you, Dr. Last time you were with us, we were sitting one-on-one -on -one talking about these issues. Now we come together as a group. To what degree do most of us who have never served have any idea what those who have served face when they come home and try to adjust, A, in terms of finding a job, and B, being a civilian? The challenges are extreme. Uh, the, the economic challenges our veterans face, it's really a, an age issue. They come home, we discussed this a little bit before, they're, they're leaving the military after four to six years of service. They're in their mid-20s. Most of the enlisted folks only have a high school degree. Uh, their entire age group has passed them by. The, they're already out of college. They're already in the workforce. They're already climbing the corporate ladder. And there they are, 24 to 27 years old, with a high school degree, military experience, and their entire peer group has passed them by. So they have these great economic challenges of getting into the workforce, of finding a position that they have a skill set for. And then also, they have great difficulties convincing hiring, civilian hiring managers, that skill sets they may have learned in the military, what that means in the civilian side. Such as? Well, you what have, skills are we talking about? Well, in my world, I, I'm an infantryman, so we have a great deal of soldiers who are very young, 18 to 20, you know, 22 years old, who have led other soldiers in combat, who have a great deal of leadership training training and development, counseling, just mm -hmm. logistical training, but they don't know how to translate that into a civilian terminology that a civilian hiring manager may understand. A great deal of responsibility is pour poured into very young men and women in the military. Describe your experience. Uh, pretty much you hit the nail on the head. I mean, when you come back, I was 20, I was 21, I enlisted. I was, my tour was when I was 21, 22. Where? Uh, con uh, I was in Camp Buka, Iraq in 2008, 2009. And coming back, it was a very big issue because like he said, all my friends were all, had their degrees and stuff like that. I came back and I'm like, okay, well, where's the secret day parade for us? And they're like, oh, well, you gotta readjust fine. Uh, Did you, you have a plan? When you were coming back and you knew you were coming back and you don't, didn't know if you're gonna be deployed again, but say you're coming back, mm -hmm. you say, hey, I've been thinking about this and uh, three months from now, six months from now, I'm gonna go back home. I'm gonna work on my plan. Were you doing that? Yeah, but everything, like every, like life, things change, you know. I had a plan, I wanted to do something else, and I actually took some time off. When I came back, I was fortunate enough to have knee surgery. So that kind of put a, 
a, a wrench in the plan, so to speak, because now not only was I recuperating from my knee injury, I couldn't go to class, I couldn't do anything like that. So you're watching people go by and you're like, well, what do you really want to do? And it had to take time. So it was, it was a very, very hard adjustment period. Emotionally and psychologically, describe it for you. Something, you're never going to be the same when you come back from any combat tour. Like, that's what I realized. You're not going to be the same person regardless Why of what not? war it is. It takes a piece of you. Uh, to, you have to literally put your life on hold for a year or how, however long it is, and you're not the same person while you're watching, let's just say if you're married, for example. I've had plenty of my uh, battle buddies who are married. Now they're married with kids. They're not there with their wives. They miss birthdays, first steps, graduations. My E7, actually, when What's we that? were deploying, uh, starting, starting first class, I'm sorry. Okay. She was actually, the day we were deploying, her daughter was graduating high school. She couldn't attend. So that right there, seeing that and just seeing it at a young age, you now realize everything is not all fun and games like everybody thinks it is on TV. Big adjustment. Yeah, very big adjustment. Still adjusting? Yeah, to this day. It's, it's life, you know. I did it at a young age, and now, like he said, I'm 28 years old, and it's like, okay, people, if you compare yourself side by side to other people, they have their degrees, and I'm still working on mine. So in the workforce, it's kind of hard to kind of, kind of catch up with that. Interesting. Talk to us about some of the challenges that uh, women in the military face that are comparable to what was just described, but also in addition to those challenges, there are others that may be unique to women. Well, sure. Uh, so uh, women have served uh, side by side uh, men for many, many years. Uh, and it's just been recently that uh, the, the new regulations allowing women into a more of a, a combative role. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they haven't been in in combat, being whether they're in transportation or logistics. And it, the thing is, though, is even though combat may be the same, women as well as it, quite often react differently and perceive things differently. For example? For example, uh, we have two friends of ours, uh, of, of Colonel Sutherland's, that deployed with Colonel Sutherland, my co-founder of Dixon Center. And one was an Army. Uh, soldier and he was shot in the shoulder and his reaction was they messed up a perfectly good tattoo the there was a female soldier who was shot in the leg and they actually had they had to amputate part of her leg and her comment was well my husband still loved me I'm not the same person so the the physical the the emotional aspects that Quite often, women come back from war or combat is, is very different. And the, one of the issues that we have is that cookie cutter solutions aren't working. Women need to have an option to to receive uh, counseling or that is separate from men. Is it different men. from the kind of counseling that a man would receive with coming home? It it may be, but it's different. Everyone's unique. So, so that's why no cookie cutter approach. Cookie cutter solutions will not work. And quite often, a lot of women are experiencing, unfortunately, military sexual trauma in addition military to. Military sexual trauma? In addition to the combat experience. Real quick, translate. I don't know, we should never say real quick when you talk about that. But I know this is a huge area. We'll, we'll deal with this separately with you as well. But quickly, what does that mean? Uh, it could be uh, sexual harassment or sexual abuse. And so. Uh, in, in, uh, it's, it's been raised as a heightened awareness because uh, commands and are taking more of wow. ownership and taking the issue more seriously now. Important and stuff. so women, when brought into a counseling session, if you have, for example, 20 veterans in a counseling session, and if you have 15 guys and five women, I can guarantee you that quite often the women aren't going to say a thing. Be because of that makeup? Because of that makeup. They, and it's, okay. it, it puts women in a very difficult situation. It would be put, uh, for some men, it may be a very difficult situation as well if they've experienced things. But it's even more challenging for women but it's, in some it's ways. it's very challenging. Let me ask you, because, again, throughout this program, our objective is to talk about some of the challenges that veterans face coming back home, particularly when it comes to employment. But there are a whole range of other issues related to that, psychological, emotional, physical, others. But your organization, describe it. We started the organization for people with disabilities. And right after 9-11, we started to see an influx of young men and women coming back with disabilities. 
but a Marine is a Marine is a Marine and do not want to be considered a disabled Marine or a disabled sailor. So we created Be a Hero, Hire a Hero, so the stigma and myth the surrounding people with disabilities. What do you do? I'm sorry? What do you do? We do one thing, it's find them employment. And so we do everything we can in our power to link them with a corporation or an educational setting like Berkeley College in order for them to advance their Do you employment. help them with their interviewing skills? Yes, sir. Do you help them identify opportunities that may be um, linked to or correspond to their skill set? Yes, sir. And we give these, these young men and women have major responsibilities when they're in the military. And they come out, and those responsibilities are never measured within the civilian sector as a skill. Do, do, do most veterans see that what they have done in the military in terms of leadership, team building, motivating, all the kind of discipline, all range of issues that you deal with in the military, I imagine. I mean, you run a corporation, you, you're a manager, an organization. Those are transferable skills. To what extent do you have to educate veterans to understand that those are valuable skills in the workforce? The enlisted man or woman does not understand that. They think it's unique to the military very often? Yes, that's correct. That it's not a civilian skill set. That's did you correct. Did you think of it that way? Uh, I kind of knew the value of it because uh, for, fortunate enough for me, I had a bunch of people who were in the corporate sector, so they just kept instilling in us that what you do, what you, what we instill in you can be also transferable, transferable into the civilian world. So I kind of, me personally, that was my own personal experience, but a lot of my colleagues... That may not be don't. the norm. No. And Berkeley does what in this regard? We help our students understand uh, those traits that they learned are extremely valuable to civilian corporations. The idea, for example, the major one we try and teach them is the idea of teamwork. Every branch of the service, regardless of what you do, your basic training and initial training, it's really about teaching you the value of the team, because you can only win in the military as part of a team. So the entire essence of teamwork is beat into you with <laughs> push-ups and, and you know every other type of activity you can learn. You can learn that your battle buddy is the most important person. You learn that when you go down range, the only way everyone gets home is by everybody working together. You can take that skill set into the civilian workforce, and civilian hiring managers like that. They want people who are team players who can work together as don't a group. They, excuse me for interrupting. Don't they also like people who can and will get the job done. Get the job done as a team, and they also appreciate the skill set that our veterans learned of understanding a, a hierarchy. Uh, they understand authority. They understand a chain of command. They, you know, they work very well with people above them and people below them because they understand the value of that. So when you teach that to our, our graduating veterans, that they have skill sets people want, they become valuable. You know, some of the emotional and psychological issues that veterans face, some more than others, obviously, depending upon their experience, what they've seen, what their emotional and psycholo psychological personal personality profile is going in. Who knows? A lot of variables, right? We were just talking about this before we were coming into the studio where our producers were getting ready for the show, and I, and I asked this question, you know, metaphorically, or excuse me, you know, just trying to rhetorically go through this in my head. I thought a lot of veterans have these skills and tools, leadership, teamwork, get the job done, collaborative, the whole bit. But then you've got these emotional and psychological scars and issues that you're also bringing back. And we were debating this, and I thought, do you have to hide those? Do you have to disguise those? Do you have to make sure that no one can see those in the workplace? You're shaking your head, no, no. why? Because here's the thing, is that uh, there is an, a desire across the nation to help our, our returning veterans. It? I see it. I've traveled to 560 communities over the last four years. By the way, describe your organization. What is it? Easter Seals Dixon Center. Colonel Dave Sutherland and I um, co-founded Easter Seals Dixon Center about two years ago in 2012. The concept actually started when we were both working uh, as active duty officers uh, on the joint staff for Admiral Mullen in the Office of Warrior and Family Support. Admiral Mullen at that time was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He wanted the, an office set up because he and his wife recognized that there were challenges of transitioning and reintegrating uh, for our veterans and our military families. But he wanted an office that specifically went out, traveled the country, and matched the donor to the need. Because everybody wanted to do something, but he wanted an office to be able to focus all of this desire on what is it that the, our veterans and families need. So we really, quite frankly, laid out what we saw as the a successful 
model for transitioning and reintegration, which was an education, meaningful employment, and access to health care, which includes information and options. And one of the things that is key to making that work is everyone has to work together. The community has to come together within a community, a collective impact, where it's a wraparound approach. Educators have to talk to employers. Employers have to talk to so, uh, the... So, so, uh, sorry for we'll come back to the other issue of the psychological issues uh, and component here, but I'm curious about what you're saying, and I want everyone to jump in here. I heard you just say that this cannot simply be done. We cannot succeed in helping our veterans uh, reintegrate, if you will, back into society successfully if it's just veterans involved. It that, takes a that, community. That schools need to be involved, corporations need to be involved, nonprofits need to be involved, we in the media need to be involved. It is all of our respons collective responsibility. Is that what you're saying? It is. I agree. Yes. And, and we agree across the board here. There's no question about it. If we do not bring, the problem is, is there is so much out there for these young men and women. What do you mean there's so much? There's so many opportunities and resources? Organizations. <clears throat> is it confusing sometimes to very, veterans? Very, very confusing. Like where do they go? Where, well, there's so, much, there's so much out there, but where do you go? It's just so confusing for these young men and women to find an organization that truly can assist them. Just putting a label on your garage door doesn't make it viable in all cases. Sometimes it does work, but many times it doesn't. And to what degree are corporations, those hiring, understanding their role in this? It, it's one thing to say, yeah, we hire veterans. We go out of our way to hire veterans. That, that's really not ex simply what we're talking about. Well, we have here. a lot of corporations that do that, but you have to understand, and we have to, at the college level, we have to train the students to understand that, yes, they're a veteran, and they're corporations that want to hire you, but you still have to be you still have to have a degree. You have to be trained in that area because you're still competing against people who have college degrees, who have experience. So while corporations want to hire you, you still have to do what like Ryan is doing, get into college, use the GI Bill, get that college degree so now you become more marketable. But is there any difference, you think, for a corporation working with someone who's a veteran? You treat them differently, act differently toward them, or is it, hey, come on, we're all in this together. Yes, you were a veteran. Uh, you didn't serve. Doesn't really matter. Or does there have to be some sort of understanding and training on the part of those who are employers? Uh, for me, I would actually say um, to pick up on that same point, you have to know a little bit about your your veterans as a whole. What should they need to know? It's like she, like she said earlier, the cookie cutter approach doesn't do with everything. For yeah, but example, you said before it takes a piece out of you. How is an employer respectfully? How is an employer supposed to even begin to understand what that means? I mean, uh, just doing your uh, knowledge, you know, like uh, just doing your research, knowing your community, knowing your, uh, your surrounding areas, knowing your personnel, for example. Uh, like he said, like... Uh, but, but we can, respectfully, here's the thing I'm trying to get at. Can, employer, can an employer who really wants to do the right thing, who really wants to be supportive of this effort, can he or she really ever understand and truly empathize with what you're talking about. When you say something like, it takes a piece out of you, you can never get back. And I'm sitting there thinking, I, I understand intellectually what you said. But it gives you, you at the same time. The veterans come in, and that's what we try and teach them at the college. When they walk in that room to interview, well, there may be things you learned when you were traveling the world and going on all these deployments and missions. You, you brought a, away with that experience. You brought the skills of teamwork. You're saying you brought confidence. the positive. Right. You, but what you about learn, the You know you can deal with stress. You have been through situations. Yes. Real stress. You, yes. yes. Well, stress. it's easy to talk about the negatives, but you also walk in that door with a great deal of positives that other people don't have. You, know, when you can handle a crisis potentially differently than someone who handles something that's a lot less of a crisis as if it's the worst thing in the world. Correct. Yes. I've seen people at college in our classroom. Other students would be, you know, going, you know, stressed out about finals or something like that. <laughs> our veterans will be like, I, I used to get shot at every day. Taking a final exam is not <laughs> yeah, stressful to me at all. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. They, they walk in with skill sets and experiences that do make them marketable. Do, do so. you think employers actually do need to, I'm not going to say be trained because I'm not sure what that means, but be, yes. you're saying yes. 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 Well, and one of the things that we're doing is we're working with the HR manager. So, the, for example, the Society for Human Resource Management. Which we're is the national organization of human resource professionals. Yes, sir. And so we're actually working and training them to help them understand not only a veteran's resume,
but how veterans think and helping them translate their skills. I was a surface warfare officer in the Navy. What does that mean? I, I drove ships. So if I translated my skills, I'd be a tugboat captain right now. <laughs> Not interested in being a tugboat captain. But taking a look at the management and leadership skills and the skills and values and competencies of all of our military service members. That's what we want HR managers and HR professionals. In a positive way. But Jeff, yes. let me talk about training corporations. Go ahead. See, <coughs> we've come up with these um, software programs that take a person's MOS, military um, occupation, right. and convert it into a civilian job. So if you drove an 18-wheeler in Iraq, you're now an 18-wheeler on the New Jersey Turnpike. That doesn't work. What if you want to be a chef? Yeah. It doesn't work. So, so that's what you mean by cookie cutter? That's correct. What you, does work? Speaking to the veteran, seeing what their heart wants to do with their future. And there is goals that these young men and women have that aren't necessarily military. And we need to be able to help them send them to a university, to a college. Um, if that's the case, I'm now working with the uh, New York uh, Shipping Association for longshoremen. We want to mm. recruit women to offload the cruise ships. There's so many opportunities out there that are non-traditional employment. Corporations, it's easy, it's sexy to say we're going to hire 10,000 veterans. Sounds great, right? It's beautiful. But do you really want to be a, a greeter in a department store or serve somebody coffee? That's not what you went into the military for training. Do you have a sense of what you want to do longer term? In the beginning when I came back from Iraq, no, I did not. It took a couple years, to be honest with you, because like I said, to touch on everybody's point, when I came back, I didn't know which way to go. There were this organization, that organization, kind of get everybody it's like wants a to help, room. but yes, yes, what? but nobody understood. Like <laughs> it's hard. Like they said, the cookie cutter approach doesn't uh, doesn't work. My MOS, I'm an 88 uh, Mike. I'm a truck driver. I didn't want to be a tactical truck driver. I didn't want to be a truck driver <laughs> when I came out of the military. And also to touch on his points with my skills coming out, there's a my confidence level has soared because of certain things that I went through. Like, for example, speaking in public. I used to be terrified of it before. Now it's like, well, I've been, to use the phrase, I've been in war before. This is, what's the worst that can happen? You know, like... Oh, you, back up. So all the folks I deal with, both here in the studio and in my other work, training people of public speaking, who freak out as if they hypervent, can't do it. I can't, I'm sorry, can't do it. And their careers get stunted because of that. They literally can't speak in public. You say what to that? And you were freaked out by it before. You say what now? You just got to do what you got to do. If you want something bad enough, you'll do it. You know, like when, you, when you're forced to do something or you're, I look at it like this. My life was on the line 365 days a year. I didn't want to go out there, but I chose to go out there. So now I look at things and I take it as that was the worst thing that, the worst thing that could ever happen to me. This is nothing. So therefore, you look at public speaking now as? I don't want to say a joke, but it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal to me. <laughs> and you tie that directly to your military experience? 100%. What do you want to be? I heard it says something to do with fashion. Help me. Uh, if I'm, my, career, my actual degree is in fashion and marketing and minor in international business. So I'll probably go marketing for Fortune 500 company and stuff like that and being behind the scenes. But need be. Why behind the scenes? Why not out, why out front? Wherever my career takes me, whatever it lands, I'm not trying to short a pigeonhole myself. Whatever it takes is whatever it takes. You have confidence now. 100%. More confidence than when you went in. You were how old when you went in? 20. And I was 21 when I was overseas. How old are you now? 28. Much more confidence. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Because I learned it in the military. Without, without the military, in my eyes, without the military for me, I wouldn't understand who I was. It took me to be a man, so to speak, the military, because it whips you into shape. Like, when you have someone screaming down your, down your throat every single day, you have to do push-ups two my runs, waking up at 0400, 4 o'clock in the morning. That wears out of you. So. so if you had a boss who raised his voice or her voice in a workplace, you'd be what? You'd laugh at it? I wouldn't laugh at it. I would respect well, it. Well, I mean, in the person's face, but you wouldn't be thrown off by that. Not necessarily. No, because I dealt with it for so long. It's like, OK. You understand their, object their objective, and you understand yours. When you hear him, what do you think? Is well, he a bright future? Absolutely. It's what it's, you know, it's what the veteran base is. They come home. It's not just the initial training and mm. uh, everything that goes with that, but once you deploy, once you serve a number of years, once you go overseas and serve your country, you understand there's a great deal of pride 
It's an all-volunteer force. Everyone walks into that recruiting right. station of decision. their own free will, and That's they sign right. that paperwork and raise their hand. And almost to a person, you never say 100%, but it's nearly 100%, when they come home, whether they make a career out of it or just do one tour of duty and come home, every single one of them is just proud that they served. They're proud you know, to come home, show pictures to their family. They're proud to go up to their father or their uncle or their mother who served maybe in Vietnam or maybe even older. And they have that pride of when their grandfather comes and hugs them who fought in World War II, that kind of thing. And then they go on with their lives. But it's that point of pride and confidence that they, they went and helped yeah. America. Cannot thank you all for your service to this country, and we wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, New Jersey Natural Gas, Wells Fargo, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Choose New Jersey, and by NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. This program has been made possible in part by Kessler Foundation.